today's scripture comes from the letter of James, chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. And we're going to be reading uh, from the ESV. Uh, I'll be reading from the ESV, but we encourage you to find the scripture in uh, your, your Bibles. Uh, if you have a pew Bible or you brought a Bible app, uh, that's always a great thing. We will be referencing the scripture throughout the message, so we encourage you to do that. Uh, again, the passage is James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, friends, today's message is, uh, well, second to last in our sermon series on the letter of James, Living Faith. And today's message is the purpose of patience. Uh, How many of you uh, would consider yourself to be a patient person? Just kidding. I'm not that patient. (laughs) It's something I struggle with a lot. And uh, uh, maybe we'll talk about honesty in future (laughs) messages. No, No one raise their hand. Are you guys all that patient? I don't know about you, but this is something that, that is, is definitely a work in progress in my life. Something that, um, you know, one of those things where maybe I think at certain points in my life, I might have thought that everyone was just like me. You know, if you're stuck in traffic or if you're stuck behind like a long line at the grocery store and the other line is moving faster, you just get annoyed. That's just what happens. Or when they block off 94 with very little notice, 94 West, and you have to take a circuitous route to church that takes an extra 15 minutes, you might get annoyed. It might be uh, something that, that tests your patience. You know, I used to think that, uh, uh, you know, everyone was just like me. Uh, because I do have problems with patience, until I got married, and with my wife Erin. Um, I'm sure you know Erin might tell you herself that she might have her own issues with patience, but they're different than mine. And there are times where we're like going to dinner, and you know it's like the light turns yellow, and for me I'm like, yellow means hurry up, right? <laughs> you gotta go, and she'll just wait and out like like there's a part of me that just like starts like itching you know and just like my, my foot gets impatient i'm like why, why why didn't you go you know and she's like we're not in a hurry like no no you're right we're not you know or th- this used to bug my wife so much that there used to be times where again we'd be going to dinner or someplace or going to the mall and uh you know the weird thing about where our house is is there are like literally like five different ways to get to campus. And and so, you know, if she takes one of the ways that I'm like, oh, you're gonna go that way? You know that way is about three, four minutes longer than this way. (laughs) And she's like, who cares? Who cares? You know, it's like four minutes, right? Oh my goodness, this thing, this impatience is within me. It's a real thing. But it doesn't have to exist in everyone. And again, I'm not saying that, you know, I think everyone might have issues with patience, but they're different for different people. Is that just because we're born that way? Or is that learned behavior? Are there ways that God can teach us to be more patient, that we can actually become more patient people? Or are we just doomed? Like, oh man, I'm just going to be just always an impatient person. Brothers and sisters, there's something that I learned um, for me is that impatience, I think, is causing a lot of problems in my life. You know, maybe for you, you've noticed this. You know, it's not just an issue of like, oh man, you know, everyone's just, you know, everyone gets a little impatient. 
But for me, it causes a lot of stress. It causes a lot of anxiety. It causes me to treat people in a way that I'm not very happy that I'm treating people those way. Sometimes my family, right? There are times my kids are getting ready in the morning and I get impatient and I start yelling at them or something and it ruins my whole morning. You know, and then I can't stop thinking about the fact that I yelled at my kids, you know? Then I'm like, oh, I gotta preach a sermon on patience, right? <laughs> oh man, that's not so fun, you know? And brothers and sisters, I wonder. Uh, so in my family, um, a, a lot of the men in my family have issues of patience. <laughs> we're we're, we're hot-blooded males, as they say. We, we have a temper. And a lot of us have high blood pressure. A lot of us have heart issues. Brothers and sisters, could these things even affect how long you live? I actually happened to, I, I just looked up, uh, as I do, like, you know, when I'm preparing a message, I, I look up Google images of stuff. And I looked up this Google image, impatient, and I was like, oh, that's like me. I don't wear a shirt like that, and I don't have that impressive facial hair, but I often get impatient in the car. But I noticed that this uh, picture was actually uh, attached to an article from The Telegraph. It's a, a website in the UK. And it was about, uh, the title of it was, uh, Could Impatience Be Shortening Your Life? And there was actually a study in Singapore that they did of over a thousand college students where they did a very simple experiment. And it wasn't the kind of impatience like, like road rage type thing, but it was a very simple impatience. Uh, it, it was this thing where they played this game, and at the end of the game, you had an option. Either I will give you a certain amount of money now, or if you wait a day, I'll give you more money later, right? And so it's, various, it's a very simple thing. I don't know if you guys uh, heard of the marshmallow experiment that they did with kids, like you either get one marshmallow now or two marshmallows later. It was kind of like that, and that was kind of what inspired this experiment because they found that the kids who waited for the second marshmallow did better in life, right? They were more successful. They, they followed these kids for a long time, and they found that they were way more successful by, by worldly standards. Um, and so they thought, hey, let's do our version of the uh, marshmallow experiment, and let's see if this affects longevity of life. And so what they did was they studied uh, these things called telomeres. Telomeres are the end caps on chromosomes. They keep the, the, your, your uh, DNA from unspooling. And so uh, the telomeres, over the, the course of life, they start to deteriorate. And so the shorter your telomeres, uh, the, the, that means that you know, you're aging faster. And so what they found was the people who chose the money quickly, who were less patient, had shorter telomeres. Isn't that interesting? Right? Could it be that, for me at least, I mean, it's kind of a funny thing, but when people are whizzing by me in traffic or that person um, kind of skips the line, they're, they're less patient, you know, and everyone's waiting to merge, but that one person's like, no, I'm just going to go to the front and I'm going to expect people to let me in, right? And that person does that. And for me, I'm like, oh man, that person's winning. You know, that person's going to get to work before me. That person is saving extra time. Well, brothers and sisters, you can rest assured in this. That person's going to die before you. So, <laughs> just kidding. Kind of. Kind of. Are they really winning? Are you really winning when you are less patient? Or is there something that is actually, when we say patience is a virtue, maybe that's true. Well, brothers and sisters, let's look into uh, this passage. This is a great passage that talks about patience and uh, the purpose of it. Why do we need to be patient? Is it just because patience is a virtue? Or maybe, as research is suggesting, maybe there's more to patience. Longer life, happier life. Or maybe there is a purpose that God has for it as well. So let's just jump right in, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. So now we have to recognize that this was a very common belief amongst uh, uh, Christ followers. They believed that Jesus was going to come. And most of them believed Jesus was going to come in their lifetime, right? And so, obviously, that didn't happen as far as we know, right? Jesus didn't come back, and it didn't usher in the end of all things. That's what they thought was going to happen, but it didn't. 
so, you know, for some of us, we look at these passages that talk about the coming of the Lord to say, well, guess what? It still applies to us. Because Jesus hasn't come, then we also must learn to be patient. We also must learn to wait. Could it be that the coming of the Lord is sort of meant more in a spiritual sense, a metaphorical sense, all the ways that we need Jesus to come into our lives? I don't know. That, that, that could be. But brothers and sisters, regardless, this was something that all believers really believe was a virtue, that you were supposed to be patient. You were supposed to wait. That there is something uh, very important about that. And, and we use the analogy, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth. The word for precious in uh, Greek uh, denotes fragileness. Right? Things are precious because they're fragile, because they can break. You you ever hear like fine china, those fine dishes? They are precious because they can break. That the fruit of the earth is fragile. It is crafted together in the way that God wants it to be. And if you mess with it, it might break. I, I know maybe we're stretching that metaphor a little bit, but there is something about what we are waiting for that must happen in a certain way. And so it says uh, that the farmer has to wait on it, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. So this is something about farming that I didn't know, but I guess in this region there were two rainy periods, early rains and late rains, right? If you were impatient, you're like, okay, early rains, that's it. Right? Okay, now where's the fruit? It's not going to come. It needs both of those periods, the early rains and the late rains. And I think that um, there is a lesson uh, in terms of patience for us sometimes, that for us, the process, the whole process needs to happen. And sometimes, you know, we think we waited long enough. Like, okay, I waited. I was patient. I was patient for one day, right? Or I was patient even for one year. You know, when you see the way it talks about patience in the Bible, you know, you, you, you think about uh, Jacob, who, who waited for, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Jacob, who waited for his wife, and he was tricked. And so he married the wrong sister. Uh, and, and so he had to wait seven years, had to work for seven years uh, to marry uh, Laban's daughter. But it ended up being Leah. Right? And it wasn't the daughter that he wanted to marry. And so Laban was like, oh, you must have misunderstood me. You see, you know, uh, Leah, she's older, so she needs to get married first. Um, but if you work for me another seven years, then you can marry my other daughter. And so what do you think Jacob did? He's like, man, I waited long enough. No, or I, I demand that I get to marry her. He worked another seven years. Another seven years. Talk about early and late rains. Oh my goodness. Right? And, and that is a little hard for us to understand in this day and age. But why? It was precious to Jacob. Right? Rachel was worth it. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to wait. Right? I, I'm going to wait because she's worth it. And so it, 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 I, I included this little cartoon. This was also in my image search and impatience, right? But if, if a farmer were to say to a crop, grow faster, it doesn't work. It takes as long as it takes, right? There's no point in yelling at the plant and saying it to grow faster. Things happen the way that they're supposed to. And I believe that being patient is learning to uh, be synced to the rhythm and the pace that God wants for you to have in life, right? We might want to speed those things up, but could we be jumping the line of God's blessing? What I mean by that is maybe things were supposed to happen in a certain timing, right? And in our impatience, we're like, okay, let's speed this up, let's speed this up. But could you have incomplete fruit if you do that? Fruit that isn't quite mature because it missed some of the rain that it needed. Uh, Brothers and sisters, let's move on in verse 8. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Um, that word, establish your hearts, that, that phrase I thought was very interesting. Um, the word establish often gets translated as strengthen. Strengthen your hearts. 
But that doesn't quite get at the meaning of it. Because strengthen could, we, we, we think of strengthen like, like bodybuilding, right? Like, arr, you know, get stronger, make my heart stronger. You know, there is an aspect to that. But what it really means is planting, right? Establishing, like kind of getting your heart to a place where it just stays. It sticks and it will not move, right? The word establish, that's what it means. Um, I, I included this little picture, uh, University of Michigan, established 1817, yeah, that you'll notice that a lot of institutions, restaurants, businesses, when they want to show you, you know what? Our business is stable. Our business is established. It's not going anywhere. They'll, they'll include that. They'll be like, established, 1817. It's very, very surprising when you see like businesses like that. You're like, oh my gosh, that's been around for so long. I always think it's funny when uh, some restaurants, like I think they're trying to be cute, they'll be like, like Bob's Tavern, established 2016. Like, what? <laughs> like, that's not impressive. You know, like, whoa, two whole years, Bob? Wow. <laughs> you guys are tried and true. You know, what you're supposed to think when you see that date is like, wow, that place is not going to close. They're not going anywhere. They've been doing this a long time. You know, and so establishing your hearts, that's what patience is about. Will you stick and remain with God? Will you remain with God no matter what happens? It's not just about waiting. Because we know that waiting is never a neutral thing in this world. Because this world is not a neutral place. There's a lot of difficulties that come to waiting. There's a lot of struggle that comes with life itself. And so the patience that it's talking about is talking about establishing yourself, planting yourself in the presence of God, with God, and saying, I will not move. I'm going to be here no matter what. Brothers and sisters, this is not something that is very easy for us in this day and age. Right? For a lot of us, when the going gets tough, we get moving, right? You know, I've talked about this before, and brothers and sisters, I don't mean to say that there aren't legitimate reasons for, for leaving, you know? Uh, but I think that for a lot of us, this is where society is going. You see fewer and fewer established 1817 signs, don't you? You know, restaurants don't last. As a matter of fact, maybe Bob's Tavern is kind of impressive, 2016. You know, if you ever go up and down South University, just every year, there's like new restaurants, right? You know, restaurants, uh, they come and go, especially in popular places. They don't last long. People are fickle. They're like, ah, man, I don't want to eat Bob's Tavern anymore. I'm going to eat at Rick's Tavern, you know, whatever the case may be. But our, things change. Everything changes. And when going gets tough, a lot of us, we get moving. It happens in the church. It happens in life. It happens in marriages, right? It happens in jobs. Whenever things get tough, we get moving, right? And, and just talking about faith, right? Our faith in God. How many times does the going get tough and you're like, you know what? Forget this God thing. Forget this Christianity thing. It's too hard. I don't feel good. You know? This isn't making me feel good. Right? You'll notice in this passage, it never talks about feelings. It says we must establish our hearts. Where is your heart, brothers and sisters? Is it with God? Is it established? Is it in a place where it will remain? No matter what happens. This was the faith of the people who came before us. And, and it goes on to say, Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be judged. Grumbling is another way of showing our impatience. Right? Like, oh man, when is this thing going to happen? What's wrong with this person? You know, it's another way of rejecting the will of God. I'm not okay with how you're doing this. I'm not okay with the way that this is playing out. So we grumble. It gives us this weird sense of like, you know, at least I can do something. I can complain, right? I mean, you got to do something, right? This is ridiculous. How long am I going to have to wait for my food? We all do it, brothers and sisters. 
But I, I think what they're, they're saying is there is something in grumbling, especially grumbling against one another, right? What is the pers- purpose of patience? What, what is God trying to do in our lives? It seems like when we grumble against another person, that is leading in the opposite direction of the purpose of patience. The purpose of patience is trying to do something within us, trying to change us in a way. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. I believe this painting is called The Patience of Job. And this is how this passage most commonly gets translated. Uh, You have heard of the steadfastness, the patience of Job. But this is the funny thing. Was Job really that patient? Do you guys know the story of Job? So Job was a guy who uh, was was very blessed by God, very righteous man. And um, Satan comes along and is like, hey, the only reason why Job is following you is because he has blessings in life. Material blessing, he has a good family, he has a lot of money, he's got a roof over his head. If you take those things away from him, he will fold like everyone else. And so God allows Satan to test him. And all the things start leaving him. He starts losing everything. He loses his family. He loses his fortune. He loses his home. He loses his health. And everything is just going against him. And, and so his, his wife is like, man, what's wrong with you? Why don't you curse God and die? Yeah, there's something severely wrong with you that all these bad things are happening to you. The friends come along and they're like, okay, Job, you must have sinned. There's got to be a reason for this. They're trying to understand what is the reason? Why would anyone have to go through something like this? If you look at the book of Job, it is not a story of a guy who just sat there and just, um, um, that's the way we look at patience. That's not the patience of Job. The word steadfast here means to remain under. It doesn't mean that you're quiet, and it definitely doesn't mean that you're passive. I want to read for you uh, what William Barclay, um, in his uh, daily uh, study Bible series, his commentary on the book of James, what he wrote about this. Um, He says, um, We generally generally speak of the patience of Job, but patience is far too passive a word. There is a sense in which Job was anything but patient. As we read the tremendous drama of his life, we see him passionately resenting what has come upon him, passionately questioning the conventional arguments of his so-called friends, passionately agonizing over the terrible thought that God might have forsaken him. Few men have spoken such passionate words as he did. But the great fact about him is that in spite of all the agonizing questionings which tore at his heart, he never lost his faith in God. Behold, he will slay me. I have no hope. Job 13, 15. My witness is in heaven, and he that vouches for me is on high. Job 16, 19. I know that my Redeemer lives. Job 19, 25. His is no unquestioning submission. He struggled and questioned and sometimes even defied. But the flame of his faith was never extinguished. Brothers and sisters, um, I think that some of us, we misunderstand patience. And so we just think that this is impossible. So we just write it off. We don't even try. But the core of patience, as we learn with Job, it is about remaining under those things. It is about sticking with God no matter what. That's what establishing your hearts are about. I don't know about the rest of you, but me and my house, we will stand for the Lord. I don't know about the rest of you. You may abandon your faith. You may run when things get tough. 
but I will stay. I will learn how to work it out. There might be crying and wailing. There might be even just times where I'm like, I don't even know, God, if you're there. I I, I don't even know if this is doing any good. But I'm going to stay. I'm going to remain here. I'm going to learn. And what it talks about here, it says, you have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord. What was the purpose of the Lord? What was the purpose of the Lord for Job? What you'll see with Job is that all these people come along and try to tell Job, hey, this is what God is like. Right? God is a vengeful God, so you must have done something wrong. Right? And all these people try to figure out God and try to figure out how God could do something like this with Job. And in the end, what Job learns from God is really, at the end of the day, he doesn't fully know what the purpose of his suffering was. He never gets a full explanation. In fact, this is what God does. God says, okay, Job, here's the deal. If you can answer any of my questions... I will tell you why you had to suffer. Okay, you ready? Okay, tell me, how high are the heavens? Can you answer that? Can you tell me how many water molecules are in the atmosphere? Can you tell me how many goats graze on the mountainsides? Can you count them for me and tell me? If you can explain any of these things, Job, then I will tell you how this, how, why you suffered. No, you can't. Job, there are things that are above you. And what Job learned, ultimately, was the greatness and vastness of God. He learned to trust in God way more than he did before. And to not just trust in a God that was blessing him, not just trust in a God that was benefiting him at that moment, but trusting in a God that he knew was completely holy and powerful, but also, as it says here, he learned that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. His suffering didn't last forever. Actually, the end of the story is is very happy. Job gets everything back, multiplied. He is abundantly blessed by God. You see, brothers and sisters, the suffering wasn't the end of Job's story. Right? Now, I don't think that the whole point was just so Job could get blessed more, brothers and sisters. It wasn't about like the marshmallow thing, like, you know, Job gave up one marshmallow and he got a million marshmallows, you know. But I think it was really about Job learning to know God in a new way. Brothers and sisters, what is the purpose of our suffering, of our patience? The purpose of patience, I believe, is for us to become like Jesus. And so when we learn to endure suffering, it is, as it says in Scripture, taking up your cross. Right? It says that Job learned the, the purpose of patience. So we have seen the purpose of patience. Right? How the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Could it be, brothers and sisters, that the purpose of patience is to make you compassionate and merciful? To help you to become more like God, more like Jesus? Right? Because this is the thing. When I am thinking about winning, when I'm thinking about how other people are whizzing by me, as I'm getting annoyed by the, the people, my neighbors, who share the road with me or share this life with me, The last thing I'm thinking about is being compassionate and merciful. I'm not thinking about love at all. All I'm thinking about is myself, right? And this is the thing. Don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters. I understand that for a lot of us, this is just the way you're supposed to live your life. I need to be in control of my life. 
So if I can make my car go faster, <laughs> if I can get to the destination faster, then why not? I want to show you uh, one last thing that doesn't seem related, but I do think it is related. It says, but above all, above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Right? This seems to be that whole kind of like not using the Lord's name in vain, you know, not swearing, that kind of thing, you're like, okay, this is really weird, because a second ago, we were talking about patience, and now we're talking about swearing oaths. Uh, Pastor Steve, I think you're supposed to make these two sermons, right? These are two different things. But think about this, brothers and sisters. Why is it that we are not supposed to swear by heaven or earth? That our yes is supposed to be yes, and our no is supposed to be no. Why would a person swear on heaven or swear on earth? What that is about, brothers and sisters, is trying to twist and make things happen according to our will. You are trying to use God to conform to your will. Right? Like, maybe you're, you're talking to someone, they're like, hey, how, how can I know that I, I trust you? And you say, I swear to God, you can trust me. Right? So what are you doing? You're using God's name. You're using God's reputation to get what you want. And that's why uh, it, it also says in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount uh, that this is something that is evil. This is something that you are not supposed to do. The whole thing with patience, what it is all about, brothers and sisters, I think for a lot of us, is that we want to be in full control of our lives. We want to be able to dictate what happens and when it happens. And the whole idea of learning patience is learning that if God truly is God, I mean, for one, it's not going to do any good, right? Our plans and our schemes to make our lives better through uh, hurrying through life isn't going to get you there. I mean, it might kill you faster, right? It might make, make your family life miserable. It might make you miserable. Right? Like, ramp up all your anxiety issues. And brothers and sisters, is it worth it at the end of the day? But if I can learn the way of patience, God, your ways are your ways. And so I'm going to learn that you are compassion, compassionate and you are merciful. In other words, as Dallas Willard says, and as I like to quote, the world is a perfectly safe place for me to be. This world is perfectly safe because I have a loving God. I don't need to rush through it, worried that I'm going to miss out on some blessing. I don't need to try to make things happen all the time. I can just chill sometimes. I can just rest. It's something that I've had to learn. Can I just wait and sit with the Lord? And I've tried to do it every day for 30 minutes. I try to do uh, 30 minutes of just silence with God, of doing nothing with God. And when I first started doing it, it felt like suffering. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, when is this going to end? This is the worst thing. Oh my gosh, I'm not doing anything. Oh my gosh, this is such a waste of time. But one of the things that started to die within me was that spirit of impatience, was that anxiety, that stress, that, 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 that kind of, that, you know, that, that, that drumbeat within me that's like, ah, 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 something has to happen, something has to happen. I've talked to so many people this summer who, who uh, have talked to me in the past about their anxiety issues, about how stressed they, they, they've been. And they said, Pastor Steve, you know the funny thing is that when I have nothing to do, I feel more stressed. I feel more anxious. Brothers and sisters, it is not just a product of what is out there in the world. Of course, the things out there in the world affect us. But now it is in here. And so what I want to learn is to establish myself with the Lord. I want to learn, God, that I am perfectly safe with you. I can wait. I can chill. I don't always need to make things happen, God. Because you are God. And I am not. Can I ask the, the praise team to come up? 
Brothers and sisters, um, I do believe that patience, that, that, that endurance that God wants us to learn, will create in us, hopefully, more of a compassionate space to be more like Jesus. And brothers and sisters, more of a compassionate space for yourself. Maybe that's part of it too. As we're rushing through life, we're also, you know, as we judge other people, we're also judging ourselves. You know, we're, we're also really, really hard on ourselves. So brothers and sisters, I, I just want to give us a moment to just rest in grace. So you guys can start playing some uh, mood-setting music here. <laughs> But brothers and sisters, so many of us, we go through life rushing and worrying. We're worrying, am I falling behind? Am I doing enough? Am I enough? Man, that is a heavy, heavy burden to carry. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary, burdened, weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You know what rest looks like? It looks like doing nothing. <laughs> You know, yes, there are things God will give us to do. But when I do them, I want to do them in the spirit of patience. In that heart, knowing that God is in control, that God loves me. So brothers and sisters, let's just take a moment to just rest in the grace of God. And maybe you need to hear God's forgiveness. Maybe you've had a hard time listening to this message because you know how impatient you can get. <laughs> And the enemy's been whispering in your ear like, yeah, that's right. Look how impatient you are. Look how horrible you are. Brothers and sisters, you are forgiven. What has happened in your life, it's in the past. You can't change that now. But what we can change is right now saying, I'm going to establish my heart with the Lord. I'm going to learn to wait upon you. I'm going to learn to be with you. I'm going to learn to struggle through some of these challenges that I have in life. Whatever it is you're going through that is challenging, can you at least say to God, God, I want to stay with you. I'm going to plant myself in the banks of the rivers of life because that's what your presence is to give me new life, to refresh me, to restore me, to forgive me. So brothers and sisters, let's take a few moments just to be in the presence of God, just to rest. Precious God, we believe that you are compassionate, merciful. God, that your love covers a multitude of sins and mistakes. Many of us have been rushing through life and we've missed the many blessings that you have for us, God. We try to make things happen and we've done it to the detriment of relationships, of our own mental health and well-being. We've done it to the detriment of the kingdom, God, that you are trying to establish within us and in our communities, God. So, God, we want to turn back to you, Lord. God, we ask for forgiveness, knowing that you are a forgiving God. And, Lord, we want to learn to stick with you. Maybe some of us have been running, running from our problems, running from our impatience, but God, we want to be established with you again. It is a new start. It is a new beginning. Whenever we repent, whenever we turn back to you. So God, I pray that we can receive that grace today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's right.